Hey, Tim. Hey, Graham. How are you doing? Hey, Lucas. Hey, Graham. How's it going? All good. <clears throat> and yourselves? What was that? It all good. And you and your good selves. Doing good. Doing good today. I will probably be hosting because Ross is actually <laughs> he's stuck at the uh the mechanic, I think. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, happens. Yeah, it's taking longer than he expected. You know how cars are. <laughs> yep. Had the same experience a couple of weeks back. <laughs> oh, did you? Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> Knock on wood, I haven't had any issues lately, but let's you never know. Hi, Tim. Hey, hey how's it? How are we doing? Hi, Lucas. Hey there. I think you're muted, Lucas. That's it. Yeah, cars cars can be real fun. <laughs> okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. Let me share my screen because I'd like to have something visual here. And we'll do what we usually do and just start with kind of the change log or the release notes, whatever you want to call it. And we'll go through and, you know, cover the things that we've gotten out recently, and then we'll open it up for Q&A and also cover some other things. So we've updated our instructions for embedding the chat widget. And this update, the release notes I released the other day, actually just had you know the GHL and the WordPress ones that we released, but we actually have much more now. So we've got uh, Wix, Squarespace, uh, Shopify, we think we have the major ones covered, but as always, you know, if one of you has an idea about one we should cover, kind of let us know and we will get that done. Mm -hmm. um, for the Stripe account integration, we discovered a, well, actually what we, what we discovered is kind of a, a flaw in some of the terminology that Stripe uses when connecting your Stripe account. They tell you to set the country code, but the user is not able to actually do that. So we talked to Stripe support and found out that what we need to do is actually provide a UI in order for that to happen. So if you need to Stripe, connect your Stripe account and it's not in the United States, um, although I think some of you have connected it to the UK and had no problems at all, but re regardless, there's now an option to set your country when you're connecting your Stripe account. So if anyone's watching this and you know, you're having issues, let us know, we'll help you and assist you with that. We also improved the lead generation email. Now we're doing this in phases because there is a plan to make it more of a template to where you can set all the surrounding text. And then the, the, the variables would essentially populate in the template and just display. But what we did to start out was we improved the formatting of that email. Let us know what feedback you all have on that because I still don't love the formatting yet. Um, I think the JSON is just basically being pretty printed. And what I had meant originally was to make it a little bit more uh, not JSON basically. So we can definitely improve that. Does anyone have any thoughts on that actually? Mm. Or have you not had a chance to see it? I've got mm -hmm. one client who's using it and they're... Um... They were a bit confused with the formatting when it first came through because it just it looked a bit scrambled, and they were okay. having to sort of pick out, you know, what what the actual uh, information was saying. Um, Got it. Okay, that makes sense. It should no longer be scrambled, but it, it still is JSON, and we can turn it into you know the actual like label colon, and then the item, and if it's a list, it would be kind of displayed in a list of uh, comma separated list. And in fact, I will open an issue later today to kind of do that. Unless unless anyone wants it in JSON, which I don't think so. I think you'd rather have a webhook if you really wanted, wanted JSON. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, we will be continuing to work on that. Also a very minor thing, but it is kind of a little bit of a usability thing here. The bot temperature slider, it's, not a, it's now a slider. Interestingly, there's been some debate when we were setting this number. It, it, our UI says zero to two. Um, and in the J chat GPT docs, it says both zero to two and zero to one are able to be set. Anyway, I, I don't know what the truth is. I asked chat GPT and of course it says zero to one, 
but um, maybe it, it does go all the way up to two and they just figured, okay, no one's going to want to set it that high or, or something. I'm not sure. So let me know if anyone finds out the history of that. Um, well, well, what oh, to, sorry. What, what, oh, what go, go ahead. What was that? You, if you play around with that slide, is it, the, is it the way it responds? Yeah, like it too. It's just, it's deviating crazily from, at least it was when I tested it, you know, what was that a year ago at this point? It would, you know, completely deviate from what the instructions were that you told it. Maybe they've toned that back a bit and it really is just creative now. I haven't tried it lately. <clears throat> um, the app version number. So we add, someone had brought up the idea that, you know, in your white label version, you may not want to show the app version number to your customers uh, because it wouldn't make sense to them in some ways, which I guess that is a good point. And so we added the ability to disable that. By default, it is disabled, so you would need to re-enable it in your account if you do want to show that for, for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. uh, just an, another encouragement to use Loom videos whenever possible. We've been asking customers to do that. For one thing, it just makes it easier for you guys. That way, you don't even you don't even really have to type out an entire email, right? You could literally just send us the Loom link. Um, and it is free to use up to a certain point. As far as I know, we are, of course, paying for it. So maybe they have changed things, but I don't believe so. And really, it's just a great way to show us easily and it helps us resolve it more quickly without a lot of back and forth. Um, we added a persistent white label banner is kind of what it's called here. And what that is, is when you're logged into your when you're logged into stammer.ai, but you've deployed your white label version, this banner will no longer be hideable from that version. And it'll prompt you to kind of go into your white labeled version. So whatever your custom domain is. And the reason for that is, you know, we think most customers should probably be in that location. And it was causing confusion originally when people were deploying it. And then some things kind of weren't changing, right? It still looked like stammer. So mm -hmm. let us know if there's any feedback on that. Uh, we did remove GHL as an option in the scheduling section for sub accounts based on someone asking for that. Also, a, a small thing, the Mandarin text is now ca capturable in the lead generation. There was a problem with the code there where it wasn't capturing Mandarin for whatever reason, I guess because it's UTF-8 or 16, I can't remember which. But um, that should be fixed now. There was also a minor bug with the chat bot icon. Uh, I didn't fully watch that video, so I don't understand the issue, but we did get it fixed. Um, and that is out now. Future developments though, a lot of upcoming future developments that are exciting. A lot of stuff we've been working on on the back end these past two releases. That's why you're not seeing a lot of front facing stuff. There's actually stuff that has been deployed to production. You can't see it yet because it's not ready for general release. One of those is the Facebook Messenger integration code is actually live today in production, but no one can use it because we're trying to get it approved via the Facebook uh, API approval process. Luckily, we are making progress. We finally, as a part of that, we had to get the company actually verified on Facebook, which we've been trying to do that for six months. It was actually comical. And it wasn't like literally six months of work. It's that we forgot about it for a few weeks and would come back to it. We finally got it verified because we we literally are a real LLC in Texas that you know has been around for years actually, and is a holding company at this point for some of the other products. But um, yeah, that took forever. But hopefully the Facebook API stuff will not take as long. And we're working on that now. Um, one interesting thing we're working on is the product database feature. This is giving our models a way to kind of query a database of products right at, at its core. And today, the way it works is it's a knowledge base that's doing semantic search. I made a video lately that went into way too much, much depth about how that kind of works, but essentially it's, it's, you can think of it as almost like a, um, a search, a match on meaning, basically. So if you type in, if a user types in, what kind of puppies do you sell? It's going to search your knowledge base for words or a phrase that mean the same or a similar thing as what kind of puppies do you sell? And so that's the matches that come up. And you can already see how that wouldn't be great if you have a product database, right? If you have a list of products, um, the way the semantic search works is it returns some of the surrounding text. 
And if your products have like massive descriptions to where it doesn't have all the data, it's not going to get all the data it needs to answer the question properly. And that's kind of a, a problem with semantic search in that case. One approach we could use to solve that is to increase the context that it returns. So the amount of text, but that's not even a pop, uh, you know, a, that is not scalable as well because chat GPT does have limits on its, uh, its tokens, its own context window. So what we've decided to do is create a function that chat GPT can call that would give it perfect data. So if a customer comes in and says, Hey, what, what sizes do you have available in this shoe or what colors do you have available? It can take, it may have to ask them, you know, which shoe are you referring to, but it'll take that product name, do a fuzzy, a fuzzy search on the database, get back the products that match that. And it should have all that clean data in there, including product images. At least that's the vision that we're thinking with this. And later on, we could even, you know, connect it to Shopify get all the product information from possibly their database for your, for your products. That's what we're looking into. Mm -hmm. um, also at the same time, a big thing we've been working on is this sub prompting technique. The idea behind this is that we've noticed as you all have that for the examples that we have in the database, right? That the scheduling and stuff works pretty well and you can get it to work very reliably. But the moment you start, adding too much complexity into the prompt. And they said they fixed this, which we will be releasing uh, the new models that they rolled out a few days ago soon. I need to open an issue for that actually. But they said they fixed it. So maybe that'll partially handle it. But we've noticed overall that as you get more complex with the prompt, it has a tendency to start to hallucinate, right? Or just not pay attention to instructions. And so what we're thinking is, like I said, last office hours, remove that make it a sub prompt temporarily where it's just, you know, you remove literally everything else from the prompt except for scheduling. It gets the user to schedule that appointment and only focuses on that. And then you return it to the parent prompt. That's what we're thinking. We know we have an approach to doing it. We've tested it a bit and it seems to work. So we're working on that now. Um, Yep. And then of course, plans to support new GPT models that mean that better maintain the instructions and hallucinations. That's what I was just referring to the new ones they've released, but that is it. And actually one thing I want to cover really quickly. Um, and Tim, I assume you're, you're fine with this since you did post it in the discord. Um, but Tim, we just, I don't know any of you didn't see this. I guess actually, Tim, do you want me to turn it over to you and you can explain exactly what this award is? Because this is super impressive. Yeah, thanks, Tim. So um, Corporate Vision is a uh, is a company I've worked with for quite some time with my agency business. And when we launch new products or we want to raise the profile of um, business wins or stuff that we're doing within the company, then we reach out to them. Uh, I hadn't realized that they do um, an artificial intelligence award, uh, which is actually, this is in its third year now. So um, it's open to companies to, to submit their own products to, um, but they actually found us, um, whether that was true, us doing our work with them previously through the agency, uh, and they came across Bobby. So they... Uh, they basically interrogated it and worked within the parameters, their judging parameters, and uh, they gave us the award. So the award is for the um, uh, AI-led website communications and lead generation company of the year. So we had to explain a little bit about what the what the the, the idea was behind Bobby and what the concept was, and uh, yeah, that was their award. So uh, pretty pretty stoked really it's uh it's a good one to kick off the new year with and it helps to raise awareness and i think also by having this kind of thing out there uh as a marketing tool you know it it gives new customers the confidence to come along and and buy into a subscription as well so i would recommend it if you can if you can find any way to get your projects uh you know recognized by a third party whether that's a, a competition that you enter or a, an award that you go for then it definitely helps to raise the profile mm. well done, yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense that is really cool i'm really impressed with that and i've seen you've been i've seen you've been sharing a lot of content, AI related content on LinkedIn as well, which I didn't realize that until I started looking today, but that's, I mean, that's genius because you're putting yourself out there as 
someone who's, you know, sharing content about AI and at least knows, you know, enough to have an informed opinion and how to use this stuff to solve real business problems. So that's great marketing, I'm sure. Yeah. And this is, you know, this is where my, my client audience live. So, you know, the more we can raise the profile of the products and services, but also for me to raise my profile in terms of being a go-to person in that field, a bit like Graham does in, in his network as well. It's, it's, it works really well because you mm. direct it to those types of customers. And, you know, I'm, I'm doing actually a, a sprint at the moment with a, a number of other colleagues. So we've, we have a little WhatsApp group and we have a team where we, we, we agree that we'll publish three times a week and then we all jump on and like and comment on their, uh, on their posts. So it's, it, that again helps in the algorithm within uh, LinkedIn to raise profile. Brilliant. Oh, wow. That's, yeah, that's really, that's really smart. So that's a group that you joined that you're all sharing that kind of content and kind of upvoting a bit. Exactly that. Yeah. And we just run it through, uh, through WhatsApp. So, I mean, we could, we could actually run it through um, discord in the agency section and anytime you post something, you can post in there and then people could jump on it and like, and uh, like, and comment. Yeah, that is brilliant. Okay. Yeah, it I'll just start sharing building. content. Because I know I, I see you post quite a lot as well, Tim, and, and Graham, you do too. So mm. yeah, yeah. My my but I, I need to start posting AI related content, to be honest. Most of it's been kind of product product management related content lately, which I'm I'm on a weird kind of war against non anyway, let's not get into that. But yeah, I, there's a lot of bad product managers out there. Uh, but anyway, um, that's super impressive with that award. So yeah, that's fantastic. And I guess let's at this point open it up to to general Q and A questions that you all have, comments, feedback. I have a meeting with Drew later on, Tim. Mm -hmm. um, I created a chat box, which I basically took what you given as a hundred percent and just changed the industry and then added, uh, um, you know, searches and that kind of thing to it. Right. But for some bizarre reason, when it asked me for my email, it asked me what the name of my agency is. That is wild. Uh, and it just came out of nowhere. Cause I've just literally changed everything. Everything else is about a flooring company. And then it comes, what's the name of your agency? Even though I've just given it my email. And I've tried everything. I've tried, you know, making up names. I've tried real names, et cetera. So it's obviously something, and I can't work out. There's no mention of, I've been through the prompts like three times, mm -hmm. and I can't see anything that mentions even the word agency. So I can't see where it's picking it from. Okay, that must be something weird going on with that. And you cloned it from the marketplace, is that right? Yeah, I cloned it from the marketplace. I must admit, I've redesigned it from the marketplace. But that's predominantly because I just wanted the original kind of ideas and layout. But all I've done really is just add a different generic information. So there's nothing that relates to anything relating to the agency. And as far as I can see, there's nothing that relates to the agency in the prompt at all. Did you ever have a question like that in the prompt? Um, not in that prompt, no. That's so weird. Okay. Yeah, can it you... Prompt, it was your prompt that related originally to an agency. So maybe it's somehow, that doesn't make any sense. Remember, okay. should have forgotten. I don't know. Anyway, I've, spoke, I've got a meeting with Drew at 11 tonight, which is a bit tad late. But I mean, I thought, well, at the end of the day, just try and get the thing sorted. But What time is that uh, in PST or, or any of the American time zones? Um, I'm, I'm, uh, it, it would be um, five, I can find it. 5 p.m. EST, I think. Got it. So that's like. 2 p.m. Yeah, let me let me take a look at that before that meeting, if possible. Yeah, because Drew is, is very good at the basic functionality and stuff, but he may not know how to debug some of the underlying. Yeah, it just seemed code. weird. I couldn't understand why. Oh, now I one other question. If you want to create a demo and you want to show people how to book an appointment, how can you set it up so you can create a dummy um like google account just so it can so they can see that it works but don't basically it's an account you don't care about yeah you should be able to and that's what i've done in in the past is just created a google account that i didn't care about um or just used an account i didn't care about um i think i've actually used the ai meeting scheduler one before and yeah just connect it to it it'll 
you know, put it on that calendar and you just yeah. ignore anything. So it doesn't have to be the account. Yeah. So, so you just make sure you've got the right email in the right place. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That'd be cool. Yeah, I can do that. That'd be a better option. And I've also wondered at times, we thought about building this at one time, but we wondered, so let us know if if this is any valuable at all. But I thought about having like a demo functionality to where it would literally simulate a conversation to kind of, you know, show the customers, oh, here's the user saying this, here's the bot responding and kind of going through a flow. But we just haven't, we haven't done it yet. Could that, well, that would have to work as a white label thing though, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would be like a static conversation playing in the interface yeah. and it would only be a very narrow use case. So, so like a demo use case. Thinking of videoing the bot because of the fact that when, particularly when you try and do it on Zoom, the bot kind of has a bit of a, I think it's a Zoom thing more than a bot thing. But oh, it's that? a bit slower than normal. No, what I was, this use case was for like, when you go, when you have a user land on a landing page, and they're chatting with the bot, sometimes they're going to ask silly questions where if you could direct that conversation more or just show a demo, it really illustrates or highlights the use cases better. That's what I was thinking, but it could have been a stupid idea. I, I don't know. I don't know what others think. It's Yeah, it's not something we're investigating right now. Oh, Alex, let me let him in. No priority. What else? What additional questions do we have? Just a quick one. So if we're using uh, lead capture and then we want to try and do the uh, scheduling as well, do, the, do we keep lead capture switched on or do we do the lead capture within the, the appointment scheduling side of things? You do keep it on. In fact, there is an example now in the marketplace that shows them both being on. Great. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And let me know if you have any questions about that as you start to use it. That is, that is high on my priority list to make a video that explains that one in detail. Because once you understand how it's working under the hood, um, and especially you guys have been doing prompts now for a while, it should be easy for you to kind of modify it and get it to do what you want. Chat GPT, like I've said in some of those other videos that we that I worked on, prompting is, especially with Chat GPT, is it's a, it's a, you have to it's an iterative process so you have to sometimes when you tell it to do something if you're not super exact it will be behave, behave in an unexpected way essentially and you just have to try it adjust it test it, it takes a lot of testing mm -mm. okay what else How would it work if um, people need more security with regards, because this this issue of privacy and all this going on. Um, yep. So are we looking at look using a different method other than chat GPT? And obviously there's cost implications regarding that. And what would yeah. that be? I think you spoke a while ago about Microsoft having a more secure system, but. Yeah, exactly. And that's exactly what I was going to bring up. Um, there is a version, I can't remember the exact name of that, that functionality within Azure, but I think it's like Azure AI or something, but it, it's basically a, a, a separate version of chat GP, the model that you can deploy and it only exists within your own tenant. And mm -hmm. so in theory, we could support that. And further, one thing we've been thinking about based on feedback from some of you all, some of you have kind of your own models that you've built and that you want to kind of leverage. And so one direction we want the platform to go in, or actually the biggest direction we want the, the platform to go in overall is that we are kind of AI agnostic or, or model agnostic, or maybe even platform agnostic in many ways. And what that means is we could provide a functionality where we you give us a URL to hit up where your model resides and can accept input from our system. And you just give us the response back and we pass it back into our chat widget. And so leveraging that, you know, if you had a customer that wanted complete control over their model, 
they could deploy the model themselves in Azure. We would have no access to it at all. And they could securely give us access through uh, through some type of encryption or some type of you know key. We'd have to figure that part out. But when our, you know, when we call it, we call it securely with whatever authentication mechanism they've defined, and we just get the response from them and it goes into the chat widget. So that could be a very good option so that the data resides in their tenant fully. It's their model. They control all that data. We just function as the platform behind it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Great question. Have you had any customers that are super concerned about yeah. security and, and looking into that? IT guy today, and he was saying that, <laughs> how do we deal with it? And to be brutally honest, I said, I know we use Azure, but I couldn't remember how it would work. And I said, obviously, there's cost implications, but I don't know what they are at this point. Right. Asking, because he does IT security, and he was asking how, if we provided these things for certain companies, how that would could work. Yeah. Yeah, it's been very interesting to see companies' overall responses to this technology. Um, a lot of them have blocked it from their networks, ChatGPT, I mean, while also at the same time evangelizing AI, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, kind of ironic there, but also you've seen Microsoft has, you know, I don't know if any of you have used teams or, or edge the edge browser. It now has chat GPT right there on the right hand side. Um, so it's really interesting, but yeah, we, we can, in theory do that. We'd have to figure out how that could work. And we certainly wouldn't want to, I mean, I guess we could, you know, have a, a very expensive plan where we deploy in Azure, the models and kind of manage them. Uh, but we don't, I mean, we could figure that out for sure. I have a lot of DevOps experience weirdly, but, um, yeah, we'd have to figure out how that would work, but it's certainly possible to make it as secure as needed. All right. Cool. Good question. Okay. What else has anyone used the new models, by the way, in chat GPT? I assume they're generally available in chat GPT. What's that? Did you hear about the, the, the updates? Well, actually, let me just cover that really fast. Let's see here. So we got open AI models. Okay, so this actually happened a few days ago, last week, I believe it was. So they updated GPT, GPT 3.5 Turbo. And this newer model, it still returns a maximum output of 4,096 tokens. So that's the output from it. And I believe it was always 4,096 output, but now the input window, the context window is 16,385 tokens. And supposedly it has improved instruction following. It also now has JSON mode. Um, the outputs are more reproducible, so more deterministic. And then parallel function calling. So this is interesting. We're going to be releasing this one. We're going to be switching to using this soon. So maybe for certain use cases, 3.5 turbo may actually be, you know, better to use for those use cases now. Mm -hmm. GPT-4, a similar update. Now the context window is 128,000 tokens, which they already had a version, I believe, that had that large of a context window and we should be using it. I'll double check. Yeah, we're using this one, I believe. And now this is interesting. The latest GPT-4 model intended to reduce the cases of laziness where the model doesn't complete a task, which is exactly kind of what we were experiencing with some of the, uh, the scheduling stuff I was talking about earlier. So yeah, so, we will let you guys know when these are live. Um, so the token cost of 3.5 turbo being more than the cost of 4.5 turbo or less? Uh, it's got to be less. Let's well, see. Logically, it's less, yeah. But this token thing is a bit of an unknown quantity, isn't it, really? You don't really know what it actually means. It doesn't seem to have any tangible comparison to anything else. It's not like a... Well, let me show you, actually. So token counter... Oh, so actually... if you 
Oh, there's actually a thing you can use. Isn't there? there is. Yeah. And I've covered this in some of my videos. I need to make this, we need to put this in the UI. We're actually building a token, not building. We're implementing their tokenizer in the UI so that it'll just count for you. But yeah, oh. if we do hello world, it'll actually show you. So this is a token. Hello. Interestingly, space world is a token. And then the punctuation mark is a token. Right. So yeah, it is a bit confusing. You can kind of think of it as words though. Mm -hmm. What else? Mm. Sorry, does that mean 3.5 and 4 are using the same logic to measure tokens? Does, yeah. They all use the same tokenizer. Tick token is actually what it's called. But the price of 4 is more expensive than, than 3.5, yeah. Yeah, but they updated the pricing models also. Let's take a look at that. Let's go to openai.com. Here we go. Okay, so the input is one cent per 1,000 tokens. The output is three cents per 1,000. And as you can see, I mean, look how much cheaper that is. Wow, wow, yeah. So, if the, yep. If the responses are equivalent thereof for most simple tasks, I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And the really interesting thing for this is going to be as GPT 3.5 Turbo gets cheaper and cheaper, there's a lot of interesting programming use cases where it may be simpler. Instead of writing super complex code, it would be simpler to just send as long as it's reliable, send it to GPT 3.5 Turbo and say, hey, you know, is this a properly formatted email address? And it can return that back to you rather than having to write some kind of complex code that does it. And it's mm -hmm. going to be especially amazing whenever these models are kind of locally running. Um, then you don't have to pay anything for it except the compute cost. And that's, a, that's the future, is it, we see? That's the future. Ross was telling me the other day that some people are running these on uh, like your phone. I'm not sure. I need to look into it, actually. I tried to run a model on my MacBook Pro. Granted, though, that was like a, a, a image generation model. And that was a year ago. And it was really small or really, really slow. What else, though? What other questions do we have? Everybody's being quiet today since Ross is. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned uh, last week, I think, about the um, the landing page for the login and the customization for that. How's, how's that going? Oh, yes. We are we haven't gotten to that yet, but we will get that done. I think our dev is going to start working on that soon, actually, our kind of junior dev. Okay. And will that just apply to the signing page or will that be within the dashboard as well? That will just apply to the sign-in page right now, just customizing that. But we are adding the functionality to customize the entire dashboard. We're going to start with colors and fonts is kind of what we're thinking initially. Yep. Mm -hmm. Looks good. Oh, and one thing we're going to be working on is adding the ability to disable certain features. So for example, let's go into the user interface here. One thing that a lot of you have been asking about is the ability to disable like, you know, leads or scheduling if they don't want that and other certain things. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have a, we're going to have a robust permissions setting in here to where what you can do is, you know, change what permissions at a, at a at a whole account level so for all your sub accounts as well as going to them individually and enable certain features it'll just be toggles but you will be able to do that mm -hmm. let's go cool. does that mean then we could create more tiers in terms of pricing so if you just wanted a basic bot which was just a uh, a chat bot that would be one price, but then if you introduce leads and scheduling, you could maybe do an uplift in price on that because it's got more functionality. It could definitely help enable that. That's for sure. That is a bit more complex because we have to work with Stripe. And of course, Stripe, you know, provides a lot of value, right? The way we'd have to do this without them is 
incredibly complex. It wouldn't be possible. But yeah, well, that could definitely enable that. We would just have to figure out the best way to expose that functionality and allow you to easily create it in Stripe to where it can also work with our code because you'd have to create a product in Stripe um, and then make sure it works with our code. And it's a problem that we have actually as well. We've often wanted to add things easily, but it's it's not as easy to do without you know, changing a lot of code, basically. All right. So could you not keep create multiple packages? So therefore, you 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 basically create it once, and then it's there forever, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, that is definitely what you could do. Yeah, yeah. That's what do you, that's what you do with do with GHL. If you want to create a product package, so to speak, you would create that in stripe as a package and what is in the package is kind of irrelevant it's just the value that changes i see what you mean yeah and that's exactly probably what we would do is we would so if there was some functionality that you all kind of wanted to enable you would let us know like say mm -hmm. we want you know the the scheduling for example to only be available if you subscribe to this other tier and then yeah. you would create a package in stripe or maybe we would do it for you and then we could associate it with that functionality. Yeah. That's kind of how it could work. Yeah. Yeah. That was kind of, yeah. Hmm. What are the plans for the marketplace? What, what, what are we expecting to see in there in the near future? Yeah. So one big thing we're working on now, which actually should be quite easy, is the ability to white label the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And what you will do is go into a bot, and I think it's actually inside this part of the user interface, when you're launching it, it'll be two checkboxes. Right. And if you check a new checkbox that says something like enable in your private marketplace, yeah, that bot will then start to show up in that marketplace for your own customers. So you can so, create hierarchy of bots if you like with different functionalities or different use cases and things like that yep exactly and you can and another thing we're working on actively is also links so i forget what ross calls them but basically what it is is you'll be able to embed a link on a web page and that link will say you know clone chatbot or clone into your account whatever that says and it will then take that user straight to your white labeled version, right? And yeah. if they already have an account, it'll clone the chat bot into their account and they'll be ready to go and use it. If they don't have an account, it'll prompt them to create an account. And then right after they create it, it'll then clone it and they'll be ready for them to use it. Like so snapshot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we think it's going to be a great way for people to just send them call to actions that just allow them to immediately get started once they register. Do we okay, have cool. Right now, Tim, can you click on that link? Yeah, right now it's just four primary bots, actually five. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've got Legion with appointment setting. We've got scheduling, uh, just a Legion example. And oh, well, well, where it's not allowed to ask questions until they get the uh, the lead info, and then one where questions are allowed from the get go, and then also the old notifier scheduling bot that I was using for a while. Mm -hmm. How's that going? Notifier. Uh, as a product? Yep. The development, That's, everything. Uh, yeah, we're actually not focusing on Notifier right now. It's been pretty stable for a while now, but it, and, and, and strangely, the MRR has been you know just flat, actually, as far as it's not dropping, which is really strange. Most SaaS products, the moment you start <laughs> not promoting them actively, they kind of drop, you know? But I guess it's at an equilibrium point. But um, we are thinking of investing some time soon into Notifier because we saw kind of a competing product that made it much, much simpler. And there's also some interesting ideas around leveraging GPT 3.5 Turbo to kind of verify some of the matches that the user creates. But yeah, Stammer is the, the main focus right now. Yeah, I got you. Mm-hmm. The social listening space is is a very interesting space. That's for sure. It's just all the platforms 
came in and kind of locked everything down, right? Whenever data was found to be, data was already viewed as very, very valuable. But with the ability to create LLMs based on that data, everyone kind of came in and locked everything down. Makes sense. Yeah, it makes yeah. sense, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I think long-term, to be honest. So OpenAI is an interesting position, right? They have um, the best performing model in the world right now, hands down, with GPT-4. Although there's some rumors that with, with Google's one, I can't remember the name, that it may be better, but they haven't released that yet. But if you think about it, like who has the ability to improve these models? Um, what gives you the ability to do that? And it's kind of like access to the data, right? Also, there are some potential legal issues on, the, you know, that could be coming soon. And so I think the best positioned company right now, because they have access to a massive amount of data, is either Google or Meta. And then one interesting thing about Meta's approach, right, is that they are they're kind of backing Llama but Llama is completely open source. And you could easily see that from a legal standpoint, it's pretty, it's a lot easier to say, hey, this is fine legally because it's open source. Anyone can use it. It's built off of the public's data, but it's also open source and available for anyone to use. So I don't know, we'll see. I keep hearing, you know, interesting arguments for and against the way that ChatGPT was trained. Actually, you guys follow a lot of AI influencers have you all heard anything that gave you interesting thoughts about this no no okay there was there was one i saw today um so meta's just released code llama 70b mm. um fine-tuned and instruction tuned on significantly more code um the, i think the news thing today was all about Elon musk and his uh, neural implants and that uh that getting traction so uh, yeah he tested that on humans is that right or was that trolling uh so they've actually done a, an operation with a human patient so and I didn't know. In terms of who's who owns that data, who's gonna who's gonna manage that data? Can that person be manipulated to do things? Because now he's got a neural implant. And oh my, that's incredible! I didn't know that was approved for testing on the yeah. public. I think the U.S. they passed it last year, and this is the first operation. So. Yeah, that is incredible! Wow. Sci-fi in real time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah have you guys heard of the npc streamers no oh my god how do i describe this so it's people on tiktok and you're familiar i assume with what an npc is a non-playable character in a video game um npc streaming is when people on tiktok will perform repetitive actions that look like an NPC, a non-playable character based on people paying them credits or money or something to do it. Right. And they establish like a vocabulary. I don't know exactly how it works because it's not as interesting to me, but people love watching it for various reasons. Um, but you know, they're performing these repetitive actions like an NPC NPC and they're getting paid to do it. And it's really interesting. It's, it's kind of, it's slightly dystopian, uh, also, like I saw a guy on TikTok. So Ross had a video yesterday on TikTok that just took off like crazy about AR. And uh, it got it got me watching another video that someone had posted where he's running. And he said, I'm going to run until I get to this many followers. And he's videoing himself live. I'm just like, oh, man, that's that's crazy. We have a weird kind of dark mirror or black mirror situation going on here. Yeah, the things that people are willing to watch and pay for it, it's, it's, yeah, stupid. It's mind blowing. But if you, uh, if you meant the mechanic AR video, is that right? The car. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw that a while back. I think it's like at least a few months old now. But mm -hmm. yeah, that, that that's, 
such a cool use case and yeah it's really that interesting is. do you think people will actually it, it's weird though so like every time i see that ar video right he's got the head on the headset on the, the quest 3 or whatever it is but they're looking at a screen a monitor why would you have it be a monitor why couldn't it be like 100 feet well i guess in that use case you still want to be able to see the car, right? But for when you're just using it as a monitor, why wouldn't you just have it very large, like filling up? The, I don't know. It's kind of weird. It's kind of weird that we would use a small monitor within the VR space. Does anyone have those those headsets? Nope. Yeah, neither do I. Does anyone have any plans on this call at least to get the, uh, what's the Apple one called? Vision Pro, something like that. Yeah, it's like 3K. Yeah, I mean, it, it looks really cool. It could essentially replace your whole set up for if you're not doing any heavy i don't know graphic work or stuff like that like for us the type of administrative work that we mm -hmm. do 99 percent that that could be the whole workspace with a keyboard and mouse so that's pretty interesting and that is yeah it's going to be interesting to see where that space goes. I, I kind of have my doubts because for years people have been going crazy about VR. I think AR, like, I mean, kind of like Ross said in his video or someone maybe who commented on it, AR is where I see the most real life use cases. One I could really see, to be honest, is, you know, like an AR windscreen, you know, where it that's where Google Maps is. It's literally showing you on the road the path to go to. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. I think the new Macon EV just came out with a had a heads up display that's not unlike your small few inches one. It's like covering a good portion of that and has some kind of AR navigation stuff wow. in the heads up display. So not in the in your normal gauge cluster. Right. So right. So cool. literally in a heads up display. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is pretty cool. Hmm. Okay, cool. What else? Any any feature requests that anybody has? Anything you really want to see it be able to do? Any any? Or actually, let's maybe we open it up to you know what are your cust what are your potential customers saying? Is there any resistance that you keep getting I overall? They hate AI or they think it's stupid or. I'm still, got, I'm still waiting to hear back with regard to uh, Pardo and the integration for the chatbot conversation and lead to drop into that so Pardo then feeds into Salesforce. So I'm hoping to have that documentation ready and feedback to you this week. Um, oh, great. It doesn't look like we can do a direct web hook, um, so we might have to use a Zap instead. Okay, but it does support Zapier, is that right? Uh, yeah, Salesforce does, definitely, yeah. I think the, uh, the feedback. Surely Salesforce has an API, doesn't it? They, they can build it, but it's not available out. Oh, it, doesn't, no, it doesn't exist in commercial easy use terms, shall we say. Sorry. Let me let me come back to you on that, Tim, because it's um, obviously it's client sensitive information. So I just want to uh, get my phone oh, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. We can always schedule a meeting and and hear about the best way to do that. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I use generally I use two platforms. So Pardo and Salesforce is the platform my clients tend to use a lot. Um, there is another platform called Force Twenty Four, so that's like an email, um, an email service provider. But it's also uh, you can do a lot of stuff with like landing pages in there and um, uh, lead capture, all sorts of other things. I guess sort of a, a a more slimmed down version of Mailchimp. Wow! So what yeah, I, I remember a lot, of, a lot of my sort of mid range clients who can't afford a big system they will rely on mm -hmm. using things like mailchimp as their crm 
you know, they, they keep all of their customer data within those systems and then that's where they email out from. Really? Yeah. Hmm. So is there a market then for a an affordable CRM? Yeah, I guess. I mean, there are, there are lots out there. There's, uh, Graham, you might know that one, that UK one, Buddy CRM. Have you come across that? No. Um, the most CRMs is they do so much that nobody ever uses in 99% of what it does. Hmm. Salesforce will do so much, but by the time you've paid the mortgage to buy it, you know, you might, you might as well have not bothered. Right. I mean, the, the common one, I guess, worldwide is probably HubSpot, isn't it? Because they have so many sort of free options that you can. Hmm. That's a good point. I so I'd be interested to know if we could offer that as a service, you know, via via the white label platform. Oh, that could be interesting. How would we HubSpot? So we just push, we push the conversation directly into a client record within HubSpot. Oh yeah, I think that's something that could definitely be built actually. Although we'd have to understand, just like the one you're doing now, we'd have to understand kind of what is possible. And I don't know anything about that platform, but. We could, yeah, let us know if you, if you, if it can, you know, accept webhooks or, or however we could kind of integrate into that. Cause that's the first time that anyone's brought up actually HubSpot, but that does make sense. They do have their own, they do have their own AI as well. So I'm not sure how that would affect things and whether or not they, that's a chargeable service. So they, they're very, HubSpot are very good at um, hooking you into a platform and then upselling you with the services. Mm, like GHL. So usually when you reach a, a ceiling height of number of um, email records. Got it. Um, so they may charge for that AI. I'll, I'll do some digging and check. I've got a, an account. So. Yeah, that sounds good. And we, we want to be able to connect all those platforms, to be honest, because then if we can become the platform for white labeling things around AI services, then that just increases our value overall if, if people can just bring, but it, but it requires their system to be able to you know export that chat functionality out in some way. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I've got a quick question. Yeah, please. Uh, as I understand it, we're now quote unquote limited to uh, scheduling appointments on one calendar, right? Yep. But in the use case of, let's say there's a company that has three, I don't know, cleaners, right? And you want to have um, an AI engine that would be able to uh, schedule, I don't know, a time slot, but know that there's at least one of those cleaners that has that time slot available. So it's not just one calendar. Or would that be, because if you use one calendar for all three, you still have just one available um slot per time right so is there anything any any chance that could be possible it's i mean we have to we'd have to write it specifically for that use case which is definitely possible a little more complex and i would be curious if the bot if the llm could handle that because i think we could well i guess what we could do is and how would you want it to work so do you do you think well for one thing do you think there's a market for this for this functionality? Do you have customers that they have a similar flow like that or potential customers? Take, take a team of financial advisors, for example. Yeah, exactly. It's not that I have any uh, customers I've been in contact that said that, but looking at, for example, in, in my country, like there's not many real estate agents, so, solo real estate agents. It's more True. yeah teams of, of a few people and that goes for so many uh, industry. So I think there could be a, a, a big, because that suddenly makes the appointment scheduling useless for those types of uh, businesses. Yeah, I could definitely see that. It's a shame. Yeah. Yeah, but it could be technically pretty hard. So yeah, just wanted to get your thoughts on that. 
Yeah, I can see many use cases for it. Yeah, it's something we may have to start investigating because I can see it also. It just it just depends on what the bet. I guess I think we get to build more of a UI to where it allows the person to define whatever rules there are to determine who to schedule, right? Because in a real estate agent situation, it depends on where they're located, what area, what territory they, they cover. And it also depends on their own individual availability. So you'd have a separate calendar, but you'd also have some sort of location. Or I think, and I, <laughs> and I, I, I do have some real estate experience, but I've never worked as, you know, a, a real estate agent. So, but actually I do know several, now that I think about it. I used to, uh, used to date one, but, but yeah. And so I could reach out to them and figure that out, but yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. We've just been focused on the general use case so far, capturing that as much as possible. Um, and then trying to do some of these more niche things, although, you know, there's a lot of power in the niche, in the niches, that's for sure. It needs to be niche though, does it? It can be just a general thing. It doesn't have to be specific to a niche that facility. Like, for example, we have a sales team of six people. The leads are coming off the website. Mm -hmm. And it just goes, distributes based on certain parameters. How you set those is, is another issue, I guess. But yeah. yeah, it comes down to being able to connect with more than one calendar from my um, point of view. Yeah. But like you said, it might be. Yeah, you take a salon or anything, you know, you might have half a dozen hairdressers, for example. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, right. Like, I, I've never seen a hairdresser salon that has just one person. There's usually two or three sharing because, yeah, it makes sense to rent a space for three people. And that goes for so many things. So, yeah, that could be interesting to, to look at. And it's not that niche. It's like it's a pretty broad use case. Yeah, it's just the use case, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, it is. A, that is a common use case. Yeah. I wonder I'm if it's, I was going to say is that it's, I think it's referred to as like round robin calendaring, but whether it's a case of almost like you can link, but almost like a priority list and go, right, check this calendar first. If it's got an availability, offer it. If it hasn't, move to the next calendar on the list and so forth. And then if obviously out of the five calendars there's nothing available you go oh sorry you can't do anything then or just sort of work for it like that yeah i think you're exactly right unless in the case of the appointment the hair the hair appointment thing they may have a person they prefer yeah i mean that, that's that's a that's a difficult one right yeah it does, it doesn't have to be that yeah 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 it's I think the I think around Robin more yeah for appointment with a kind of specialist be it I don't know a chiropractic clinic or like a hairdressers or that is a thing but I think around Robin style booking for sales teams in particular is like I I work with a couple of companies that I know for a fact have HubSpot and they use that kind of um, thing of just first available it's not necessarily a specialist specialist. As such, it's just whoever's free, whack something in someone's diary. Um, so someone gives them a call back. Right. There are so many use cases for where that could be. A company employs six plumbers. That's a good point. I mean, you're right. I mean, there's a rarely is it ever just one calendar. Yeah, exactly. One could argue that just one calendar is, is a much smaller yeah. Um, yeah, market per se. But how you distinguish where they go is another issue. Yeah, we need to look into this more, actually. I think, so what I would normally do in the product space is you, uh, you, you pick a customer and you kind of custom develop it with them. Now, we have the additional complexity here that you guys are kind of in between the customer, which is, you know, a huge advantage, actually, as well. But I think what I'm saying is if one of you guys finds an opportunity that a customer is willing to kind of work with you and thereby us in the background to develop that type of functionality. I think that would be the best way to get this done. Unless you can go in there and get the exact requirements and, but we, we have to have someone we can kind of work with. 
and not that we have to directly talk to them. We can work through you guys, certainly. But um, I think we need to try to work on something like this in the future because it makes a lot of sense that there's a lot of opportunity here. I mean, I know a guy who's got 16 financial advisors. What are they using today? Like just forms, I guess, and stuff? That's basically phones and things, yeah. Huh. If you're going to automate the process, then the process can't... You can only automate it if it automates. You can't. One calendar right. wouldn't... Definitely. Right. Yeah. Because the, the, they're all available at that same time, aren't they? So... Or may or may not be available at that time, but they're potentially yeah. available. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, the other way of looking, I mean, someone that I know that would like could 100% get through the door. My brother in law owns a um, a Land Rover dealership now. If they had something that would AI that could book in for servicing vehicles, like 100%. But it obviously would need to look at multiple diaries or such because it well, in theory, it's like one diary, but with say ten slots in it because they've got ten um, working bays, like ten technicians, um, and knowing right, we're putting this vehicle in for this day or whatnot. Um, they would a hundred percent that would fly off the wall, uh, the shelves as such. I think that does make a lot of sense. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, cool. I think we're kind of, we've run out of time here and I actually do have a meeting to jump on really quickly. Any, any final questions before, uh, before we break? No, I'm going to have to go. Thanks, thanks, Tim. It was a great, great meeting. Yeah. Thanks guys. I'm sure Ross will be back next week. So it should be a little more interesting with him doing his commentary and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's been, it's been pretty great. Uh, it's, it's been a little boring, too. but I appreciate you guys saying that. <laughs> All right. I'll talk to you all later. Have a great day. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Cheers.